we've declared war on worry. I'm thinking that God is writing a new chapter in your life that is going to be marked by increasing peace and diminishing panic. Anxiety comes with life, but it sure doesn't have to stay in your life. God has a prescription, an antidote for anxiety. It's found in the book of Philippians. And this summer, we're going phrase by phrase through this peace giving paragraph. The words are about to appear on the screen. I'd love for you to sit up straight and fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope and say these beautiful passages out loud with me. If you have the passage memorized, go ahead and close your eyes and give it a shot. I won't think you're asleep. <laughs> Let's say it together. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing but a prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are Things are of good report. If there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Great job. Heavenly Father, grant that these words could become not just a part of our vocabulary, but they could become the way we cope with the anxiety that enters our world. Our hearts are heavy as a result of the tragedy that we saw on the news that took place in Charleston. Heavenly Father, grant mercy to be upon the victims, upon that church, upon that city, and yes, mercy upon the perpetrator. Father, it heavies our heart to see racism and violence, and especially within a church. How much more it must heavy yours. We offer this prayer through the name of Christ, asking that we see Jesus and Jesus only, and that you forgive the sins of our speaker, for they are many. Through Christ we pray. And all the church said, Amen. And so we begin today's message with a very simple yet important question. Have you prayed about... I'll start over. And so we start the message with a very simple but important question. Have you prayed about this? It is what troubles you. It is whatever fatigues you. It is whatever keeps you awake at night. It is what is stealing your joy. It is the disease that you cannot cure, the marriage that you cannot fix, the job that you cannot stomach, the rage that you cannot tame. It looms over life, two towering letters that march into your world like Frankenstein steps. Clomp, 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 clomp. Dominating every thought, taking all of your attention, stealing all of your peace. It hurts. I can't take any more. Look out here. This. Comes. Will somebody take this. away from me? It dominates our thoughts, our lives, and our future. Unless we learn to follow the counsel of the Apostle Paul, who encourages us to take and place it behind two other words. Pray about there now. Doesn't seem so mean anymore. Placed in its proper position, it is reduced to size. 
Prayer is the act of taking it, whatever it is, to God before it can get to you. Prayer is the act of taking it, whatever it is, to God before it can get to you. Prayer slaps the handcuffs on the culprit. Culprit. I know it's kind of a reach. But. And marches the culprit it into the presence of God. And we say, God, I can't handle it, but you can. I can't deal with it, but you can. I don't know what to do with it, but you do. And I'm going to leave it here with you. Peace happens when rather than focus on it, we pray about it. This is the idea behind the apostles' admonition. We've been looking at this passage in the book of Philippians. It's our summer project, phrase by phrase each week. We're about midway through, and here the apostle calls us to action. He says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Here we're called to action rather than giving in to it or being dominated by it. Our response is to rejoice in the Lord, pursue gentleness or level-mindedness, be aware that the Lord is near, and now take it to God as quickly as we can. Pray first and pray most. That every time these anxious thoughts appear, we can choose either prayer or despair. So choose wisely. And the apostle urges us to be those who pray about everything and do so with thankful hearts, making our requests known to God. If you'd like to fill in the blanks, his point is simple. Pray about everything. Everything. What Jesus said to the blind man is what he is saying to you today. And that is simply this. What do you want me to do for you? I've always thought that was interesting. The blind man on the side of the road cries out for help. He can't see. And Jesus says, now, what do you want me to do for you? Well, everybody knows. But Jesus wanted to hear him articulate the specific request. And he wants us to articulate our specific requests. There are several reasons for this. Before I share the reasons, so just look at the commands in Scripture that urge us to be careful and pray specifically about everything. When we were taught to pray by Jesus the Lord's Prayer, he said, pray this way. Give us this day our daily bread. That's a very specific prayer, isn't it? Rather than make sure I never go hungry, give me today what I need to eat for today. His mother Mary did this when she came to him and said they have no more wine. Very specific statement of the problem. The thief on the cross turned to Jesus and said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. A very specific and defined request. There was a needy man in a parable on prayer that Jesus told. The needy man came to his friend's house and said, friend, can you lend me three loaves? He could have said, I'm out of food, but he had a specific request. Even Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane on the night before his crucifixion prayed, Lord, take this cup. What cup? This cup of suffering. Can you take this cup away from me? There are pictures and examples in Scripture of the power of specific prayer, telling God exactly what you need. And that is also a part of what the apostle is saying here when he says, in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. In everything, by prayer, there's one word, by supplication, there's another word, with thanksgiving, I'm going to save that word for just a second, let your requests be made known to God. So prayer, supplication, and requests. Three words that are very similar, but they're not identical. 
The word prayer refers to a standing of a posture in front of God, a recognition that God is God and I'm here to talk to him. It's a, it's a big word. It's a, it's a large canvas word. It umbrellas over anything that we might do in, co- in conversation with God. Supplication suggests the person who is the supplicant, the one who is humble, who humbles himself in front of God. This might make us think of our posture before God. We, we supplicate, that is to say, we don't demand, or we don't walk into the throne room with a swagger, but we do acknowledge that God is God and he is our heavenly father. And we come with our supplicants, our humble requests. And there's the word request. And the word request is simply that. It is a specific request. It is as specific as a request you might give a waiter when you walk into a, re- into a restaurant. You say, Lord, this is exactly what I need. I am facing this challenge. Would you please help me? Now, why would specific requests be helpful in our prayer lives? Well, I can think of two or three reasons. Number one, a specific prayer is a serious prayer. A specific prayer is a serious prayer. If I were to see you today and say, hey, come over for dinner sometime, to be honest, I'm not expecting you to show up tonight. That's just a statement, right? And you're not expecting to come over tonight. But if I were to say to you, tonight at 6 o'clock, we're going to be cooking hamburgers out on the grill, uh, and Deanland's whooped up some of that banana pudding that she makes, and it's really going to be good, and we're going to have some extra patties on the grill. I wish you'd come over and maybe you should bring some sodas. Your wife still make that good pecan pie. Why don't you show up at six o'clock and we'll have a place for you. Here's how you get to my house. Here's the gate code. Be sure and park. What am I saying to you? This is a specific request. This is a serious invitation. I really want you there. When you come before your heavenly father and say, Lord, I've got a anxiety about tomorrow. Well, he hears you, of course. And remember, the power of prayer really doesn't depend upon the way we say our prayer. But there is something wonderful about getting specific about the prayer so that it is communicated to your heavenly Father that this is seriously where I need your help. So you say, Heavenly Father, tomorrow afternoon, Monday afternoon at 2 o'clock, I'm having that meeting with my supervisor, and you know she intimidates me. I know she doesn't mean to, and I don't know why she does, but every time I'm with her, I get nervous. I get dry mouth, and I get moist palms, and I lose my train of thought. So this time, Heavenly Father, would you go ahead of me? Would you do for me what you did for Joshua and the Jordan River and go upstream and prepare the way? Would you help me as I collect my thoughts? Would you help me to assemble my thoughts today. I'm going to do my part. I'm going to put my thoughts on an index card. I'm going to go into the meeting prepared. But would you, Father God, help her to be prepared too, to, to, to come in with a, a, a generous spirit and help us to have a good, clear conversation. My request is specifically this. Would you help us to have a good conversation in which both of us benefit and your name is glorified? This is my request. Now, there's a prayer that's specific, Right? And you know what happens when you offer a specific prayer? When you do that, well, then you give God a chance to show off. Because you've asked him to do a specific thing, and then when he does it, you can close your eyes at the end of the day and say, boy, God was involved in my day today. There's a beautiful picture of a specific prayer, and it's found in the Old Testament. And we, won't, we don't have time, so we won't take time to retell the whole story, but it involves the patriarch Abraham. Abraham sent his servant to pick out a wife for Isaac, Abraham's son. But he didn't want a wife from that area where Abraham was living. He wanted one from his home country in Mesopotamia. So the servant went as an ambassador for Abraham to this land to pick out a wife. That's a pretty amazing assignment. I mean, how do you pick out a wife for someone? Well, this servant did it through prayer. Look what happens. He's in Mesopotamia, and he offers this prayer. O Lord God of my master Abraham, he prayed, please give me success today and show unfailing love to my master Abraham. See, I'm standing here beside this spring. 
and the young women of the town are coming out to draw water. This is my request. I will ask one of them, please give me a drink from your jug. If she says yes, I have a drink and I will water your camels too. Let her be the one you have selected as Isaac's wife. This is how I will know that you have shown unfailing love to my master. Would you call that a specific request? I mean, he's saying, here I am. Here's what I want to do. Here's what I suggest. Create this dialogue and then I will know. The very next verse, verse says, before he had finished speaking, Rebecca appeared. God honored that specific prayer. She said the words, the servant had an answered prayer, and he saw God at work. Specific prayer gives us an opportunity to see God at work. It also gives us an opportunity to enjoy a lighter load. If you wake up in the morning and say, Lord, help me, that's wonderful. And you know God loves you and he is going to help you. But if you say, Lord, help me with this and this and this and this and this, that I see coming up today, then you have created a lighter load. A part of my morning routine on the days that I do it well, I wish I could say I do it daily, but on my good days, I make a list of what could be a challenge in that day. And as I'm sipping on the morning coffee, I just say, okay, Lord, I've got this meeting at 10 o'clock. Will you please help me? I've got to have this assignment done by noon. Would you please help me? Uh, Lord, the church is going to be mad if I don't get the sermon finished. Would you help me finish this? I won't ever say that, but you know what I mean. But I go specifically down my to-do list, and I just give it to God. And what I have discovered is if I do that and when I do that, I carry a lighter load all day. Because when I sense that deadline coming, when I am facing it, then I remember, oh, but I gave that to God this morning. Hmm, I'm thankful because he's already gone ahead of me and I can be grateful. Which leads us then to the second point. The apostle says not only pray about everything, but also pray with gratitude. That you can be grateful as you pray. You can even have gratitude as you pray. Think about the verse yet again. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. There it is. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. See, the apostle says you can begin to discover thanksgiving in the midst of your anxiety. Here we go. Our anxiety is being replaced with a spirit of gratitude. Wouldn't you love to give your day of anxiety over to a spirit of gratitude? Well, this happens as you take your anxious thoughts to God and entrust them to him. I used to experience this immediate gratitude in a high school algebra class. I don't know what part of the brain is designated to help a person understand algebra, but I didn't get that part of the brain. I just didn't. You can crack my skull and look in and there's a big piece missing. And it says intended for algebra. And it's just not there. I've looked for it. I've tried to buy a piece at Walmart. They don't sell them. I just didn't have it. And so when I was in high school algebra class, I would look at that textbook and I would say, everybody gets this but me. It's like everybody was speaking Mandarin Chinese and I, I, I just couldn't get it. But I had this going for me. I had a wonderful math teacher. And he made the statement and offered the invitation at the beginning of the semester he said, if any of you have trouble with a problem, you bring your problem to my desk. You get up out of your desk and walk to my desk. By the end of the semester, there was a trail in the carpet between my desk and his desk. And I would walk up there and I would bring my problem and I would place it on his desk and he would look up at me and I would always say this, you promised that if we have problems, we can bring them to you. And he would smile and say, yes, what's your problem? And immediately I would begin to feel a sense of gratitude. Was the problem solved? Was that part of my brain restored? No. But 
I had entrusted the problem to someone who knew how to solve it. You can do that right now. Right now. This problem that's keeping you awake, or this, this, this it that's taking your joy, you can give that to God and immediately begin experiencing a sense of gratitude because you have entrusted the problem to Him. And He is able to save you from bearing the burden for it. He will help you. Here's a principle that I think is very, very helpful, and I hope you'll consider it as well. Find a promise of God and build your prayer around it. Find a promise of God and build your prayer around it. When I went to the algebra teacher, I would say, now you promised. I would remind him of his promise. And then I would make a request. Many times our prayer times are nothing more than complaint sessions. Oh, the mortgage is too high. The neighbors are too grumpy. The sermon is too long. I know you never say that, but but they just become complaint sessions. Wouldn't it be better, rather than reciting our problems, to begin rehearsing God's promises? Remind God of his promises. Remind God of what he has said. I like to start my prayers with you said statements. You said There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I stand on that today, Lord. You said that all things work together for good for those who love you and are called according to your purpose. I'm standing on that today, Lord. You said that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You said that I'll not be a lender, uh, not a borrower, but a lender. You said that you would walk me through every day. You said that you'd be my shepherd. You said that you'd take me through the valley of the shadow of death. So you find a promise that fits your problem. Does that make sense? Find a promise that fits your problem. Turn your attention away from it and focus more on the problem. There's a passage in the Old Testament that urges us to do exactly this. The Old Testament uh, prophet said, put the Lord in remembrance of his promises and keep not silence. Put the Lord in remembrance of his promises. You said you would walk me through the waters. You said you would lead me through the valley. You said that you would never leave me or forsake me. These kind of prayers activate the angels of heaven and they touch the heart of God. Miracles are set into motion. Your answer may not come overnight, but it will come. And in the meantime, God will give you peace. If a boy... 10-year-old boy goes up to his dad when his dad comes home from work and he says, hey, dad, remember you said we were going to play catch when you got home from work. That tells the dad two things. Number one, the boy was listening and the dad's integrity is up for grabs. And so that dad is going to say, okay, you're right. I said it. How much more will God, who wants to give you blessings, who loves you, How much more will he be excited when you come to him, quoting to him, citing to him promises? And he'll smile and gladly give you exactly what you need. This is the promise in this wonderful parable that I'm going to conclude with out of Luke chapter 18 and verse 2 through 8. I hope you'll take time to read it on your own. But it is the most interesting story, very entertaining parable that Jesus told that involved two characters. One is a persistent widow, and the other is a cranky judge. Jesus says that this cranky judge did not respect God or care about people. Can you imagine someone's life being summarized by those two phrases? He didn't respect God, and he didn't care about people. He was a judge. He had a beautiful home up in the Hamptons. He had all the money he could spend. He had a chauffeur-driven limousine. He lived in a gated community. He had a big old swimming pool that was shaped like a dollar sign. He took all his money from the mafia. He didn't care about God. He didn't care about people. All he cared about was getting those bribes that kept coming in. And so he made millions and millions of dollars. He was so happy. He didn't care about God and he didn't care about people. And he especially didn't care about that widow 
who kept asking him for help. She is described as a persistent widow. In verse 4 and 5, for a while the judge refused to help her. But afterwards, he thought, to, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped verse 3. Sorry about this. In that same town, there was a widow who kept coming to this judge saying, give me my rights against my enemy. So two ends of the, of the social system. A judge who's corrupt and who has a lot of money. A widow who has no clout and she's gone broke. And so the widow has an enemy. I don't know who it is. Maybe a landlord who wants more money. And she comes to the judge pleading her case. And she keeps asking the judge for help. She asked the judge for help so many times that she drove this judge crazy. Now, here's what Jesus said. For a while, the judge refused to help her. But afterwards, he thought to himself, even though I don't respect God or care about people, I'll see that she gets her rights. Otherwise, she will continue to bother me until I am worn out. She was wearing the judge out. Every day when he showed up at work, she was sitting outside his office. I need just a minute of your time. He ignored her. Every day when he went into the courthouse, there she was sitting on the front row. He was behind his bench. She held up a sign. I need one minute of your time. Every day when he went to lunch at Maggiano's, she was waiting. She tapped him on the shoulder when he sat down. I need just a minute. To get away from me, he said. She was driving him crazy. It got so bad that he would send his bodyguards ahead to get her out of the way. One day, he sent bodyguards ahead to make sure there was a clear path between his office and his limo. And when the bodyguard said it was, he ran out and he jumped in the back of the limo and guess who was in there? <laughs> he said, how'd you get there? She said, I just need a minute of your time. He said, you're driving me crazy. If I promise to do what you say, will you leave me alone? And she said, yes. And she pleaded her case. And he said, I'll do something. And he said, now get out. And she got out. And we look at this story in Luke chapter 18 and say, what in the world? Why is this story in the Bible? There's no compassion. There's no benevolent spirit. There's no willingness to help. There's just a reluctant judge. Well, here's the punchline to that parable. Jesus said, God will always give what is right to his people who cry to him night and day. He will not be slow to answer them. I tell you, God will help his people quickly. Remember, some parables are parables of comparison. Others are parables of contrast. A comparison, like the parable of the prodigal son, we are like the son, God is like the father. But this is a parable of contrast in which God is not like the judge and we are not like the widow. God is not like the judge, Jesus is saying. He's not hesitant to help. He does care about people. He is mindful. He is compassionate. Yet, if that self-centered judge would help people, how much more would God who is kind and gracious, whose middle name is love, how much more would he help you? You're not the widow. You're not at the end of the line. You're not at the bottom of the totem pole. You're not forgotten and neglected and victimized. You're a child of the Almighty God. You're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. You're destined to reign with God forever. And so God will respond to you quickly, and he will do exactly what is right for you. This is the promise of God. And so my invitation to you is simply this. Don't let it get to you. Don't let it take any more sleep. Don't let it take any more joy. Don't let it rob you of being the person God has called you to be. Whenever it comes up, you take it immediately to God. You pray about it. You leave it with him. That's your part. God's part, we'll talk about next week. But it has something to do with a peace that passes understanding. Amen. Lord, this would be our prayer. That whenever we sense the emotion of anxiety within us, that we would quickly respond 
in a spirit of prayer. And then every time that emotion comes up, we would pray again. And if we're praying all day, that's okay with us. We've had enough of this despair and anxiety. Help us, dear Father, to learn to be people of prayer. Through Christ we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.